everyone. Hello, thank you for joining today's webinar. This panel explores how green infrastructure, resilience hubs, and other approaches towards community resilience can be visioned, implemented, and owned by the community. Waterfront Alliance is a U.S.-based nonprofit organization with a growing alliance of more than 1,100 partners that focuses on environmental and economic development and bringing about real change to shorelines, waterfronts, and coastlines across the nation and in New York, New Jersey region. For Climate Week, the Waterfront Alliance will be centering critical climate resilience issues facing New York City through a series of webinars, roundtables dis discussions, at art exhibitions, panels, and coastal cleanups. We welcome you to please visit our website and learn more about all of our events this week. Today's webinar is titled, Bringing Land Back to the People, the importance of community land trusts. And it is my honor to introduce these very, very impressive panelists today. First, we have Annie Catforo, who is the Climate Justice Campaign Manager at We Act for Environmental Justice. Prior to this role, she organized alongside New Yorkers experiencing homelessness to improve access to affordable housing, she holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Human and Organizational Development from Vanderbilt University and a Master's of Urban Planning degree from Hunter College, where she focused on equity and sustainability in city planning. Next, we have Arif Ula. He is the Executive Director of South Bronx Unite, a climate, environmental, and health justice organization. He is an advocate grassroots urban planner and community activist with experience in designing and managing community development programs. He serves on the Mayor's Sustainability Advisory Board, Anthropocene's Alliance Board of Directors, and the New York, New Jersey Harbor of Astery Program Management Committee. Ashley Allen is the Executive Director of the Houston Community Land Trust she has a background in nonprofit leadership, affordable housing, education, STEM, and workforce development. Her experience as a homeless youth has fueled her passion for housing accessibility and continues to be active in the community, serving on the board of coalition for the homeless of Houston slash Harris County. She holds a bachelor's of science in food science from Florida A&M University an MPA from Governor State University and a PhD in cultural and educational policy from Loyola University, Chicago. And last but certainly not least, Memo Salazar is the co-chair of the Western Queens Community Land Trust and is a filmmaker and longtime resident of Sunnyside, Queens. He's also a local business owner and co-runs the Sunnyside CSA which aims to bring sustainable food justice to the neighborhood. Thank you all so much for being here and having this discussion with us today. As we begin, can you share what community land trusts are and how do community land trusts empower communities to take ownership of their land and resources? Go ahead and start. So community land trusts are organizations that um, put the power of land back into the community by creating more nonprofit organizations that are community run, community led, um, and removing the land from the speculative market. Once you are able to remove the land from the speculative market and put it under the control of the community, they have a say of what happens to that land. Um, as we've seen in most areas, particularly New York is no, um, you know, it's not a stranger to how gentrification happens and neighborhoods can turn over very quickly because um, individuals are, are the owners of that land. As individuals, sometimes, you know, things become, un as neighborhoods change and things become unaffordable, it may mean that you have to sell your property to a speculator or a developer. 
Um, and so then that then becomes kind of a chain reaction because once one person sells, the neighborhood starts to change over, become unaffordable for the next person and you have a domino effect. By putting the land into community ownership, it allows for the decision about what happens to be made by the collective and not the individual or based on individual circumstance. Um, the roots of the CLT um, have a social justice foundation and was started here in the United States by African-American farmers in Albany, Georgia, because they were feeling um, the pressures from the civil rights movement. And so it wasn't, ne it wasn't necessarily gentrification that was displacing them, it was the threat of uh, violence for wanting to vote, for wanting to have equal rights. Um, and so the idea of the collective ownership created a strength within those farmers to be able to not be um, persecuted or directly uh, attacked by those who were trying to oppose their efforts for equality. So when we think about um, the CLT model and where it kind of its roots here in the United States, it is de definitely based on the protection um, of land and protection of development um, for the greater good of that community and not necessarily outside forces coming in to dictate what happens to a community. Thank you so much for sharing that, Ashley. Without knowing the roots of a movement, we can't really move forward and create progress. So learning a bit about the history was super illuminating. Thank you. Uh, somebody, somebody else was about to make a comment. I'm so sorry. Oh, sorry. Now, I was just going to add to what Ashley said that over the years, CLTs have been very creatively evolved into many different uses, right? So it's like people realize, oh, we can use this model for many things. Like, for example, Burlington, Vermont in like 1980 or 81 was the first urban CLT. That was when Bernie Sanders was mayor there. And if you go to Burlington, they have a lot of great affordable housing precisely because the people there had the forethought to build you know, back when it wasn't expensive to build this community driven model that now Burlington is a much more expensive place to want to live. But there's a lot of chunks that have been pulled off the market, like Ashley said, because of the CLT. So it's like a great example of like, if you put your mind to it, it future proofs the land. Uh, to And New York, New York City has had in the past, there has been times when the government's cared a lot about housing. And unfortunately, some of the models that they built, like in New York, there's a system called Michelama that was a series of housing that developments that um, for working class people to own their homes. But there was no way to lock in the affordability. They sort of gave people cheap homes and then said, all right, here you go. And over the years, people then have the co-op boards have voted to flip those buildings to market rate and make a lot of money, whether for necessity or for greed or for whatever reason. But the problem is now those buildings are no longer affordable. So CLTs try to prevent that from happening by pulling the ownership out of a private pocket and into the community, like Ashley said. Beautiful, thank you, Memo. And thank you for offering us an example of where CLTs thrive. With that, I think that we can continue to jump into the next question. How can CLTs become a tool to bring climate resilience into communities? I can jump in here. Um, so, you know, we've learned CLTs have a real focus on land and community-led development um, and what belongs on top of that land. And so CLTs really sit at the intersection of housing justice, environmental justice, and climate justice, because oftentimes the neighborhoods that are seeing this rise in speculation, this, you know, um, uh, increased unaffordability are the same communities that have been suffering from decades of um, of targeting of polluting facilities of you know undesirable industries that are leading to higher rates of asthma, higher rates of respiratory illnesses, um, and also lack in climate adaptation. So as we're seeing, you know, more heat waves coming. These are communities that are typically a lot hotter than surrounding neighborhoods that have, um, you know had a lot more um, say over the, the development of their land, um, similar with flooding, right? So these are um, lower income neighborhoods are typically, you know, don't have functioning, you know, waterfronts or don't have proper green spaces that can absorb that extra water. And so community land trusts, um, you know, they are, they are kind of filling this gap that right now we sometimes see of the siloing of housing advocacy and justice and climate advocacy and justice um, because, they are really based in community and based in in um, local examples. And so when um, 
you know, a community is seeing, you know, these are the things that we're missing that are um, contributing to an unaffordability crisis or contributing to, um, you know, a resiliency crisis, um, you can say, okay, and, and, you know, as Memo was mentioning, there's lots of different uses that CLTs can be put towards. So um, it's not only that we need housing but, and maybe community health centers, but we also need green space. We also need a functional waterfront. Um, and there are some really great examples. I, I don't want to take too much from Arif of, um, you know, South Bronx Unite and their um, Mount Haven Port Morris CLT actually um, taking the community's climate risks into account and saying, where can a CLT um, actually come in and help because a lot of times investing in the resiliency of a community is not going to necessarily lead to um, making a profit off of that land because it's actually investing in the social infrastructure of the community. Um, and while the private market, you know, is not super interested in um, development that's not going to lead to a profit, community land trusts are, and so they can really fill that need. Thank you, Annie. Thank you so much. Arif, that, that makes me think, how does South Bronx Unite address the challenges of urban planning and development within the framework of a CLT? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And um, thanks everyone for, for being interested in this issue. I, I wanna just first start with how important I think it is that we're talking about community land trusts in the context of climate justice and in the context of um, environmental justice, that it is important that during climate week, um, we are talking about the connections between community land trusts and, and the climate. Um, and just to pause on um, the sort of larger issue for a moment, um, and, you know, land and, and climate, land and environment, you know, for, for many years, um, centuries, um, land has been used to displace, land has been used to uh, pollute, land has been used to subjugate, oppress, etc. Um, and to pause and, and dig a little deeper into the pollution aspect of how land has been used um, and connected more directly to um, you know, climate and, and, and um, you know, what, what a lot of people um, here are interested in, you know, policies like redlining you know, um, and, and uh, subsequent policies throughout the 20th century have basically relegated communities like the South Bronx and other frontline communities um, as less than, um, as um, not worthy of investments um, and um, literally prevented um, sort of, uh, the resources to be directed to these sorts of communities. What that resulted in um, was these communities then being um, basically uh, dumping grounds um, for polluters, right? Whether it's waste, uh, whether it's water, whether it's air, um, these communities, as a result of redlining, as a result of urban renewal policies, have then become, you know, these what's called, you know, sort of quote unquote disadvantaged communities, environmental justice communities, disproportionately pollution burdened communities. So there is that very strong link between land use um, and, and, um, you know, climate and environment. And the climate, um, the community land trust movement pushes back against that, right? By saying, no, this land actually is valuable and we are valuable, right? And we should determine how this land is used and we should determine what is good for our community and the voices of the community are centered. So that's my sort of long way of getting to what we're doing in the South Bronx because our land in the South Bronx, people who live in the South Bronx, residents of the South Bronx, that land, that area had been redlined. That area had gone through a series of urban renewal programs um, which have devastated the community, including with this disproportionate pollution burden. So the South Bronx, particularly the Mount Haven or more sections of the South Bronx, which is where South Bronx Unite operates, has a whole host of polluting facilities from waste transfer stations, to power plants, to last mile warehouses, to a medical waste facility, to a home heating oil facility. On top of that, you've got highways and road um, and expressways and byways, right? All of which are essentially strangling the community with air pollution and clogged streets with diesel engine trucks um, emitting all sorts of um, pollutants into the air. So, that's the that's the landscape. That's the scenario. Um, that's the connection to land. That's the connection to climate. And what we're doing is basically engaging our community 
to imagine a different future and imagine um, a different way of using that land, which creates better um, and healthier environments, right? Um, which also creates better health because pollution, of course, results in poor public health outcomes. Um, and so by, for example, on our waterfront, which is full of the types of facilities and, um, and infrastructure that I just mentioned, which is public land. I, I just want uh, everyone to know that that's public land being used to pollute and poison the air. So in a way, you know, we are subsidizing that, right? Because it's our tax dollars that are paying for that um, sub, uh, that toxic um, or, or that public land that's being used to pollute us. We're instead, we're envisioning a green waterfront, a network of seven um, green spaces to create health for the community. And another very strong connection to climate, that waterfront um, open green space would also create climate resilience, right? Because sea levels are rising um, and coastal storms are strengthening. Um, and by having green space through green infrastructure, we would also be creating climate resilience and protecting the community from the threats of climate change. I'll stop there. There's a lot more to say, but I'm sure our fellow panelists um, have, have um, some wonderful insights too. I mean, I can jump in and continue that thought if we go down a few miles to Queens from the Bronx, um, because we're in a similar boat and um, and right now we're fighting a big rezoning. So in terms of to answer the question, like, what are we doing? Uh, if you see this map here, um, just to give you a good, this is a great overview. So this is Long Island City. Uh, here is the East River. So the Bronx is up north a ways. Um, but just down here, first of all, you can see these two clumps of uh, glass tower skyscrapery sort of things. Those are new. Those have been, those are, you know, in the last 15 years, those have all popped up, uh, making LIC the fastest growing community in the country. Uh, of course, it's all luxury development. Uh, and it's all look like how close to the waterfront, you know, that they built these things. And now they're looking to rezone this second area here. And they want to build all, you know, more skyscrapers and so on right along the water, despite having massive flooding problems that they have not in any way dealt with. But then even more than that, if you look, here's Queensbridge, uh, Queensboro Bridge. And right here, this is Queensbridge. This is the largest public housing community in the country. So you have a huge number of people just up the road from a huge number of very rich people. Uh, these This community and also Ravenswood, which is another uh, public housing community, are both massively underfunded, ignored by politicians. You can't see it too well here, but right here where I'm circling is a huge generating station with four big polluting towers. So of course they built this right by these poor neighborhoods, right? Because that's where you want to stick those types of things. And so that's caused, very similar to what happened in South Bronx, has caused a lot of breathing problems and environmental problems that these communities have had to deal with forever. So what we've been trying to do is, if you, if you look at this little building here, our first project, this is a Department of Education building that was built during the FDR uh, WPA era. It's 650,000 square feet of industrial space that the Department of Education uses currently, but they are only using about a third of it. It is basically a giant closet. So we're trying to turn this into a community space with a rooftop farm, with a food co-op at the bottom, and artist studios, and all sorts of things I won't bore you with. I'll put a link in, in the chat so you can take a look at our report that we've created with an architect. But um, the point is, the city is considering... I should step back. This was going to be given to Amazon a few years ago by our governor. Uh, this was a building where HQ2 was going to be built. So they're going to destroy this building and put out who knows what. So from an environmental point of view, the carbon, just the amount of carbon released by demolishing this building is a huge waste, especially when this building is perfectly functional and could do a lot of good for the community. So we're, and now they're considering rezoning this building and turning it into uh, mixed use, which would allow more residential development, which would allow the demolishing the building to put up a residential luxury tower. And so that from a climate perspective is incredibly irresponsible. Um, so we are trying to fight that rezoning and, and advocate that they not, there are four public parcels here in this area, and we're advocating that none of those public parcels be rezoned, because if they would, they would allow private development. And like Arif said, that's our public land that should not be used for that. 
Um, there is a coalition called the Long Island City Coalition that have for a while now, many, many for 20, 30 years have been around fighting this kind of rezoning. And they have an amazing waterfront park similar to what Arif is talking about that would turn all this land into a, a flood mitigating public park. Uh, and we are very much in alliance with them to advocate for that vision. Uh, it's received a lot of positive community, you know, involvement and so on, but convincing the city is another matter. And so I guess right now, um, we're in like an advocacy state. We do want to develop that building and turn it into this uh, community um, hub, but that is a very long project of many years and RFPs and all these sorts of things um, that, you know, who knows when we were very positive, but that's a long-term project. But in the short term, it's making sure that the laws don't change to uh, rezone, which would then allow the exploitation. Uh, and, and they have not, we're waiting for the city to give, adequate answers to why do you want to build luxury towers right by the waterfront? Like, how is that even logical given everything we know? And we haven't received such good answers, you know? So we are very much in their face all the time as, as polite and respectful as possible, but very much holding them accountable to what they're trying to do. Because as you all probably know, because you're here, like that's a very bad idea. So um, that's how our CLT has been involved in, in uh, environmental justice. Memo and Avi for your super brief answer. It, it really illuminates the way that CLTs have the potential to eradicate the systems of injustice. Sarah, I think Sarah, Sarah, Sarah we're I... having trouble with your mic. Yeah. No. How do you hear me now? A little better. How about now? That'll work. Better. Okay. So I just have to be very close to my computer then at this point. I, I was saying thank you, Memo and Arif, for bringing up all of those points that illuminate how CLTs are a part of a solution that can eradicate the systems of injustice that brought us to the climate crisis to begin with. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm I back there. It's going back down. About to jump in. Oh, there we go. Oh. No, no I was saying your your volume was going back was going back down a little bit. How about now? I'm gonna speak louder. I'm so sorry, everyone. It was perfect before. <laughs> it was absolutely perfect. Uh, Ashley, since you were since you just came up. Can you share some examples of how the Houston Community Land Trust has successfully implemented resilience hubs and other resilience strategies? Yes, so as um, many people know, um, Houston is definitely impacted by climate change. We uh, recently were um, hit with a hurricane, Hurricane Barrel, but just a few weeks before that, we had what was called a derecho and really damaged um, a lot of Houston. And that's just a result of just the different temperatures um, occurring in the Gulf and, you know, climate change happening. Um, and it was very unexpected. We thought it was just going to be a rainstorm and it ended up like blowing out the windows of a lot of our high rise buildings, knocked trees down, people lost power. Um, so we are definitely a place where we have to be prepared for natural disaster, climate related um, instances. We also flood a lot um, here in Houston. Um, and so when we're thinking about um, housing and where housing is being built, um, particularly affordable housing, um, we have seen historically it be placed in areas that are um, environmentally hazardous. We actually had recently um, a community that was being impacted by a creatine site. It was a creatine site due to railroads. Um, and there were high rates of cancer to the point where they identified it as a cancer cluster. Um, and then the city was still allowing people um, to build in that area. And so we have our city policies being supporting um, housing being placed in areas that we know are dangerous. Also being able to continue to build in areas that will now reduce kind of our flood mitigation. 
So we are always having to think about how do we combat some of the policies that are being put in place to encourage um, non-resilient building. And so one of the things that we've done, some of our strategies, one, um, the city does have um, in, in some of our partnerships, and we also include this, is environmental scans before um, somebody can purchase a home through the CLT. If we find out that the home is near things like uh, concrete crushing plants or dump sites, we won't allow somebody to buy that home and put it in the CLT. Secondly, um, because we are, we flood a lot. And again, because of the way the kind of non-zoning policies that we, Houston doesn't have zoning, which I know is weird for a lot of people <laughs> to understand, but um, we don't have much zoning. So people really do build wherever and that can create flood mitigation issues. And so we do not allow for people to purchase in a hundred year floodplain area. So we look at the floodplain map and if it's in a hundred year floodplain, we won't allow for that home or that property to be placed in the CLT. And then also if you are in a 500 year floodplain, which just means that, you know, you have less likelihood of flooding, but it's still a possibility, we require flood insurance. And so then we have that conversation about affordability because flood insurance is expensive. So we do kind of have to weigh that out with each um, with each buyer in our CLT. Um, other things are um, providing resources for um, within our newsletter and just communications about how um, things that you can do to better protect your home. Um, it's your biggest asset for most of our homeowners, um, home by, uh, homeowners in our program. And so just making sure that they are aware of things like um, window insulation and, you know, roof uh, conditions and things like that. Also, things like French drains to make sure that the water is running where it needs to be to prevent flooding and deterioration of properties. Um, and then also we've had to come up most recently after the most recent hurricane, um, a disaster recovery plan. Um, because what we've seen is people um, who are limited income usually are uh, the least, um, have the least access to federal disaster dollars and they don't know how to um, navigate the insurance um, industry and because it is difficult and they don't want to pay out. And so just being able to make sure that we have a plan because in Houston, we know it's not um, if we have a disaster, it's when. And so we always make sure now kind of putting these pieces together so that we have a way to really get out there and help. We have 200 homeowners in the CLT across the um, entire county and to, across Harris County. And so that's a very, very large area to cover. And so we're trying to figure out different ways to be able to um, disseminate resources, connect people um, to resources and do interventions um, very quickly. So that's kind of what we're working on is disaster recovery policies, kind of preventive measures, but also reactive measures for when that happens. So we kind of had to put our own things in place because we are fighting against a system that encourages some of the uh, non-resilient building and, and processes for, for new homes that are coming into the area. So we have to kind of mitigate that on, on our end um, because we're seeing it all the time, kind of just um, as was being shared about putting, we don't have you know, you know lakefront property or riverfront property, but we do have bayous. And so there's green spaces and water and people like being near the walking trails and stuff. But then you have to think about when those bayous, um, the bayou can sometimes over flood, uh, overrun and flood areas. So building properties on them, it looks nice, but is that really the most resilient thing we could be doing versus putting that land and reserving it for as a flood mitigation, um, flood mitigation property? And so we have to start thinking about that too. What kind of conservation can we do to put just green space in the CLT? That's kind of a next step for us um, to kind of prevent continuous building on these areas that we know are unsafe um, and could cause uh, issues in the future. Oh, Sarah, you're, you're, you're down again. Can't hear you. If I'm very close and I'm screaming, good. No. Well, I think we're okay. I think that that is a wonderful segue into my next question, which is what are policy changes that are necessary to support the growth and sustainability of CLTs in urban areas? Go ahead, Arif. Uh, you, you, can, you can get us started, Annie, feel free. 
Okay, I can I can start us off quickly. And uh, you know, New York City has a, a burgeoning and growing CLT movement. We have now to date over twenty community land trusts that are in different stages of formation and and, and uh, acquisition and. That's really exciting. And at the same time, land in New York City is incredibly, incredibly valuable. Um, we have some of the most expensive real estate in the world. Um, and so that poses a very, um, a, a very, very intense uphill battle when you're thinking about community groups that are trying to compete with private equity um, and foreign investments for land. And so um, New York City led by the New York City community um, uh, land initiative nicely, which is a coalition of CLTs that have um, that really provide technical assistance to groups that are trying to create their own community land trust um, and also help advance legislation that can make it so that all CLTs can thrive and grow in New York. Um, has been pushing a bill package called the Community Land Act, um, which has a couple of different bills that try and um, intervene in the um, the try and intervene in typical processes of development to give CLTs an edge um, and other nonprofit groups an edge to actually be able to acquire more land. Um, the two bills I just want to mention really quickly, and I think they build on the examples that both Arif and Memo gave. Um, one is called Public Land for Public Good. So currently the city is the largest land owner um, in the, the city government is the largest landowner in the city. Um, but they have a very troubling trend of selling land to pro for profit developer for profit developers at very minimal cost, like a dollar for a lot. Um, and then that leads to a lot of this um, development, market rate development that's very out of line with what the community needs, but also our our uh, climate risks and our climate goals. And so public land for public good would um, require the city to prioritize CLTs and other nonprofit developers when disposing of city owned land. Um, so it can ensure that public land is used for uh, the public good um, and other, you know, affordable housing, um, resilient waterfronts, et cetera. And so if if a law like this was in place, um, that would dramatically change the politics and the dynamics of what South Bronx, what's happening in Western Queens with these publicly available lands that the city is holding and trying to put towards private development. Um, where instead there are CLTs with really excellent community uh, plan, community plans um, that are, are fighting for that in to get access to that land. Um, the other bill I want to mention really quickly before passing it over to Arif is COPA, which stands for Community Opportunity to Purchase Act. Um, this would give, again, CLTs and other uh, mission-driven nonprofits right of first refusal or right of first purchase to multifamily buildings when a landlord sells. So what we see in New York is um, rental housing that gets stuck in the speculative cycle where uh, you know a landlord buys it, they see it as an asset or an investment, um, and they invest as little as possible into the building while charging as much as possible to make as much money off of people's homes. But housing is social infrastructure and buildings that get stuck in that um, cycle often see really terrible conditions, deterioration, um, and that has climate risks in itself. If you can't stay safe in your home, if you can't keep your home cool or keep your home warm um, or keep your home from flooding when it rains, you know, you are at greater risk for um, climate, um, for, for uh, extreme weather than somebody who's in a home that they're, they care for and that's invested in. And so uh, COPA would allow CLTs to um, get the chance or the opportunity to actually purchase those buildings take them out of the speculative, really damaging cycle um, and put them onto a CLT or into another nonprofit um, uh, agreement um, so that people can stay in their homes and they can see better conditions. They can organize for democratic governments, governance of their homes, et cetera. Um, and so this is um, something that's also been tried and tested. They have these policies in Washington, DC and San Francisco. We're not the first, but we wanna see something like this happen so that CLTs have a real chance. They have a, you know, a, a leg up, I think on the private industry that, you know, for so many reasons has so many more advantages than community groups do. Yeah, thanks for um, that context and for um, setting us up with that understanding, Annie. Um, I'm so glad that we're talking about policy, public policy legislation, because um, I don't think um, it's uh, we can overemphasize how important that is. Right. Um, the uh, pollution burden that uh, communities like the South Bronx um, are 
forced to endure and have been forced to endure for many decades, as I stated earlier, is, is a result of um, you know, policies, public policies, is a result of um, how these communities have been zoned, um, is a result of what types of permits um, have been given to polluting industries. Um, and I'll just give you one example before talking about a piece of legislation on the city level of how we have been able to use um, legislation as a tool to uh, hopefully improve health outcomes uh, in, in a community like the South Bronx. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, in collaboration um, with the leadership of WEAC, we participated in um, a campaign to pass um, um, at the state legislature level uh, a bill called the cumulative impacts legislation. Um, and that cumulative, so when I talk about cumulative impacts, what does that mean? Well, you know, we have um, facilities like power plants. Um, on top of that, we have, you know, poor housing. Um, on top of that, you know, as related, we have, you know, uh, a disproportionate number of roadways and expressways. So all of that cumulatively creates um, really, really uh, poor um, air quality. Um, and so when we look at uh, you know, what facilities are cited in certain communities. We can't just look at the pollution that that individual uh, facility would create. We have to look at what other types of pollution existing facilities there are creating. So that's the idea of cumulative um, impacts, right? Like being able to really understand the uh, pollution of each uh, polluting facility in the context of other polluting facilities. And by doing that, um, what we will uh, hope to um, implement with the cumulative impacts legislation, which is a law now, we're going through the, um, the rulemaking process, is that no additional polluting facilities will be allowed to locate and be cited in environmental justice frontline communities across New York State, right? So that's a huge victory. Um, and that is a policy victory. Um, and that took a lot of effort uh, and it will reap benefits for communities like the South Bronx. Again, looking at the cumulative impacts of pollution, not just what one individual um, uh, facility would create. Uh, so that's, that's a, a victory. Uh, one of the uh, other pieces of legislation that we are collaborating with other organizations on is called 1% for Parks. Um, and uh, specifically so that New York City's annual budget would set aside 1% of its budget for open green spaces. There is a lot of inequity um, uh, when it comes to open green spaces um, across the city. And just like inequities across so many different issues, green spaces are not um, immune to that. Uh, and so uh, you know, there hasn't been enough investment in open green spaces in communities like the South Bronx. Um, so this uh, piece of legislation would not only increase the budget for green spaces, but also create equity um, in terms of how green spaces are distributed, um, how green spaces are, are managed and stewarded, um, and also just how, how green spaces are informed. Like, are these green spaces actually meeting the needs and priorities of community members? Um, the last thing I'll say is, Annie mentioned public land for public good as part of um, a uh, package of leg legislation that the New York City Community Land Initiative is working on. Um, and that is, of course, um, focused on, on housing, um, but also on green space, right? So the, the uh, land that I described earlier on the waterfront, that again is public land, and we would be stewarding that land under the, um, under the um, uh, umbrella of our community land trust. Uh, and so, you know, when we look at community land trusts, uh, oftentimes we think about housing, um, and which is, of course, critical um, everywhere, uh, especially in a place like New York City. But, um, you know, we it, it also includes um, a variety of spaces, public spaces, um, including green spaces. And so um, with the public land for public good um, legislation, we would be able to also uh, create more green spaces, but also give community members uh, basically say over how those green spaces are used. In short, self-determination. Thank you. Yeah, I to add to that, I mean, just so people, because CLT, the concept of CLT is sometimes not easy to wrap your head around. It's 
it's really not that complicated in the sense of like it it's just a mechanism within capitalism for people to take land ownership you know it's just sort of like it seems overwhelming how you could do it as an individual or as a person with you know as a company with rich deep pockets or whatever so all the clt i mean it's really you're just incorporating yourself as a nonprofit as a you can, you can start as a nonprofit and then move up to the 501c3 level which opens to getting more funding but either way it just gives you that sort of legal structure to then go talk to elected officials and get some other discretionary funds or or apply for grants or funding that is only open to nonprofits. So because we built this system where a nonprofit is sort of the entity that's been recognized by the state, CLTs are just like, okay, we're going to play that nonprofit game in the name of people. You know, it's not anything more than that, really. And so, I mean, there's bylaws you have to create, and obviously you have to understand the legal ramifications and funding and all of that stuff. But like, that's all it really is. And so everything everyone is saying, it's like, it's this all a community land trust is. And and the basic thing of, of separating the land from the building just allows a CLT to kind of hold the deed and be the conscience of the community while whatever group is running the building itself does what you would do normally. You know, the only difference is the CLT is sort of like Jiminy Cricket being like, ah, oh, you can't do this because we agreed that the community owns this land. It's really all it is. So, you know, I think um, it's been cool to see since I've been involved, how many CLTs have been popping up in New York City because people really recognize we're in trouble and the city is not coming up with solutions and CLTs are just the way you can sneak in there. It's really all it is. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Does everyone hear me better? Because I have headphones on with, oh, yay, the problem has maybe been solved. Oh, well, knock on wood. Uh, fantastic. So what strategies have you all found most effective in engaging and mobilizing communities around the concept of a CLT? Um, here in Houston, I think uh, it was very challenging because I think when we first started, um, homes and, and rents were actually affordable. I mean, the average person, the average income uh, in Houston would allow you to have a decent apartment. That was just, you know, five or six years ago. We saw it happening in communities that are now experiencing rapid gentrification. We're saying like, mm, we think that something's going to happen um, as other cities become unaffordable. I think we're going to need to kind of find ways to protect you know, the affordability and nobody listened. Everybody was like, oh no, we're so affordable. And in, in less than five years, the average, um, the income required to buy the median home in Houston right now is almost a hundred thousand dollars to buy the average home where it used to be. If you were a teacher or a bus driver, you could get a nice starter home. Um, and now it has gotten so far removed. Any, most people, um, again, around the average income cannot access a uh, access a home, even the quote unquote affordable homes. And so I think initially it was very difficult with the idea of one, we're in Texas. And so the idea of land ownership is very um, near and dear to Texans heart, but being able to get people to understand, do you see what's happening around you? I had to go into, I was a community organizer in Chicago and had to bring that to Houston because it does not have a, um, a, a foundation of organizing here. And so people were kind of just off and saying, okay, well, what's happening? And being able to actually go and meet people where they are to say, look around what's happening in your neighborhood. And they could look around and say, okay, I see housing, I see development, but I can't afford that. Nobody in the community can afford that. So what's happening? And so I think that visual, because you know, when somebody's saying this is going to happen and you're like, well, they've disinvested from my neighborhood for so long, they're not going to come here. And people really started to believe that. So then as it started happening, the visual of development happening that did not include them, I think is what really helped. And us going into the community and having those conversations, we didn't go in and just say, hey, we're a CLT. You can buy a house through us and not own the land. It was more so, hey, those relational organizing um, strategies of let's have a conversation about what's really happening in your community and what are solutions. And so then when you could see, seeing is believing. And so us to be able to point to a home to say, well, this home could be put into the CLT and we can make it affordable at this price. Um, and now that we're getting ready to move into rentals, being able to say, well, here's a rental apartment that you won't be kicked out of as your income increases um, that we see like in public housing. We're going to stabilize your housing costs 
so that you can thrive, so that you can catch up, so you can catch your breath in an economy where things are going up daily and housing, we're losing it by the day. So I think it was really just going to where the community was and actually having a conversation about what was going on. We went to churches. We went to the grocery store and had tables up in front of the local grocery store. We did door knocking. We actually had a business owner who was also a community organizer partner with us to help make those connections in community. So it didn't look like outsiders were coming in to just offer up you know, this program that was backed by the city uh, financially. And that can also be an issue because people feel as though city government, federal government, has disenfranchised them for so long, they're like, mm, we know you're a 501c3 nonprofit, but this is also a city program. And so being having that conversation too about, um, as Memo said, being the conscience of, uh, of what's going on here and being able to say, no, no, we're the people that are going to ensure um, that what we're saying is going to happen and that the city cannot come in and change that um, because that's what has happened before where people were given you know, free homes or, you know, as, a, as a, a type of reparation for what happened to their communities, but then were taxed out as gentrification happened and these people were displaced again. So having to create that trust was the first thing and then going into their communities, not having community meetings downtown or, you know, via Zoom, but going into their local library and community centers and saying, hey, we're coming to you. Um, and, and we're having these conversations about solutions and not just talking about the problem. And I think that was kind of how we were able to get people engaged and to give us a chance because everybody was like, oh, CLT, I'm scared. But when they saw again that we were coming in to them and hearing them and addressing their needs directly, I think that actually helped. It wasn't easy. We were fighting against a lot of outside forces, especially just the mindset of what ownership looks like. Um, and, and that was a challenge. But I think, again, creating that trust first and then implementing programs helped. Yeah, and so in New York, we it's a slightly different version of that because things are super expensive. People really aren't stuck on the idea of owning. They've kind of given up that they're going to be able to own anything. They're kind of like, look, I just want to be able to afford my rent, never mind buying something. And so... But the trust still ends up being the same thing. And I mean, one thing people need to understand is how hard it is for a CLT to thrive in a world where the government has decided not to put any money towards this. You know, like there's no, like the whole austerity mindset does, it's just, you're fighting a machine every day that like, you know, if this was FDR era where he was like, you know, a chicken in every pot and a house every, you know, for every American, that was a different time and they were throwing money. Of course, they were only throwing money at certain races, right? But like that notwithstanding, like the government recognized the value of housing. And that is no longer the case because, you know, giant corporations have been buying up the stock to make money off of and it's become a profit agency and not a place for homes. And so it's really hard. And so the only thing we have is the fact that we're going to parks and we're going to like public events and we're tabling and we're meeting people and we're, you know, like constantly talking, having Zoom calls or in-person calls with people to just promote the idea and work, see how we can work with them and spread the word and so on. And I mean, the, the QPS uh, building vision that we have that I talked about earlier is an exciting, tangible thing. So when people see that, like their eyes light up and they see, oh, wow. Like this is possible. And so that's like your way into getting people to start thinking about this whole model and everything. But you there's no way around it. We've been doing it for several years. We still don't have a property. I mean, we're 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 starting that there's one that might happen. It's very exciting, but you know, it might not happen. I mean, it's like it is a long road. So you have to really have faith that like if you build it, they will come. And I do think once people start to see and and they're like, What? You live in that place and you spend how much on rent? That's crazy. Like it word will get out, but until we have something to prove that the model works, it's very difficult because it's all it's very theoretical. You know, it's it's we we've seen models work, but that doesn't mean that yours will work. There's so many ifs and buts. So you know, we just have to keep fighting. That's right. You keep fighting. You meet the community where they are at. You let them speak for themselves because they are the experts, and then. Hopefully the progress will come, but it will because people like you all are working on this. We have time for one more question and then we'll go into the Q&A. My last question for you all 
is what do you see as the future of CLTs? I, I can start. I think uh, in New York City, at least, there's a real um, uh, movement happening. Um, it's strengthening. There are more CLTs um, that are uh, joining. There are more organizations that are seeing the value um, and importance of, um, of community land trust as a real vehicle for self-determination and as a real vehicle to um, assert ourselves in, in spaces um, and um, really inform how those spaces should be used. Um, and so I'm encouraged. Um, I think that there's some momentum behind the legislation, whereas in the past, um, we wouldn't have had um, uh, city council members championing um, piece, uh, CLT legislation. We have that right now um, within um, New York City's Housing and Pre Preservation Development um, Department. There are There is now a CLT department. As small as it is, it's still progress. And so I'm encouraged um, and hopeful that the movement will only grow and strengthen. I can jump in quickly. Um, you, I think that uh, everything Arif said, I, you know, I think that we act is really excited. We are one of these organizations that like historically was not very involved in the CLT movement because it was so focused on housing and, and thanks to the South Bronx um, and in Western Cl Queen CLT, there has been this push towards um, CLTs being at this intersection of housing and climate justice. And um, we act really wants to use um, the resources that we have to support that. Um, we act back in April was selected to be um, one of the environmental justice thriving community technical assistance centers through the EPA. Um, and this is, is um, serving as a liaison to help um, smaller nonprofits and smaller community groups access um, some of the landmark funding that's coming from the federal administration, from the bipartisan infrastructure law, Inflation Reduction Act. These are, you know, once in a uh, generation investments in climate and climate resilience and CLTs um, should be accessing those funds. Um, and so the Tic Tac is there to act, um, to help smaller organizations that have less capacity. Maybe this is their first federal grant that they're applying to, um, or maybe they don't have a grant writer on staff because you know they're they're nimble and they're, they're lean. Um, we're there to help with every step of the process to make sure that people actually have, to, that these groups actually have a chance to compete for some of these awards. Um, and so we want to see more of the CLTs in the city applying for some of these climate um, grants. And uh, that's, you know, like an immediate future for CLTs. But I, I, I see CLTs taking over New York, and that's kind of my hope. And, and we'll get there eventually. Um, for me, I think the future I want, I would like to see um, all stakeholders get involved in the movement. Um, I know in a capitalistic society, it may be hard for corporations to, to get into this very collective idea, but understanding this is an economic issue here in Houston, we're losing work, the workforce. Um, everybody can't make $100,000 and $150,000 to be able to afford the median home price here in Houston. So then what happens to the workforce if they all get pushed out? Um, and so understanding that this isn't just a housing issue. We're talking about greater implications. As it, and also in regards to like climate, that I would like to see governments um, not only just fund CLTs and, and really focus on that as a, as a permanent funding um, line item across all state, uh, all levels of government, but also not creating policies that are counterproductive to our work. <laughs> so don't go and build a home with the poorest quality materials and then try to say we want resiliency. Don't go and build housing in areas that are not environmentally safe and then be upset when people are saying, well, we have a, a population that is extremely sick. Um, I, I just would like us to kind of make sure that the policies and our goals start to align a little bit more. Um, I don't know how that works because I know that hasn't been the <laughs> how government actually works. Um, but in, in, in a perfect world, um, the CLTs again will be used as a tool, but also making sure that they align um, and with policy and that we're not continuing to see counterproductive, um, you know, counterproductive policies, for, you know, against our work. And we've seen that up here in Houston quite a bit where we talk about affordability and it's like, yes, we want to help people access affordable housing through rentals and uh, home ownership. And then we build homes that are, you know, way, way, way out of uh, accessibility 
um, as far as affordability goes, or we build apartments that are done with different uh, mechanisms like latex that are only affordable for a short amount of time. And so you have to keep reinvesting and keep trying to figure it out versus just creating a long-term permanently affordable solution like a CLT or another cooperative or shared equity model. Um, again, not being productive. We're using our funds, but not using them to the best of their abilities, um, which creates a bigger problem. So that's kind of why I see all stakeholders need to come together and we need to be aligned in how we address, um, address these major issues. And CLTs is just one tool that we can all use. And I'll just say, I, I want, um, I would love to see CLTs become like a mainstream word and that people, you know, I think right now it's very like, oh, lefty fringe sort of socialism, right? And I want people to just as your average person who's not that political and yet they see the value in community ownership and maybe that'll open their minds towards, you know, Medicare for all and all these other things that we care about. You know, it's like, it's not that hard to to grasp the idea that maybe owning everything isn't the solution, like private ownership, you know? And so if CLTs can sort of be one of those wedges and it just becomes out of practical, even if it's for selfish practical necessity, people, at least in New York, go, oh, I'm totally down with the CLT because it means cheap housing for me. And that just opens the door to, oh, wait, this is communal ownership. And, and it just becomes a, sort of a, a non-crazy, fringy sort of concept for people. That would be great. I, I think it would open a lot of other mental doors that are very closed right now. Wonderful, everyone. It sounds like the future will be CLT. We have time for one question from the audience. And the first question is, where does the money come from to actually purchase land in New York City? Purchasing land slash buildings requires millions and you're doing it without a strong revenue plan, which then makes loans more difficult to secure. How does financing for CLTs in New York work? I can talk a little bit about our experience um, and it may be somewhat of a unique experience um, because um, it is a city owned building. Um, so we were, uh, through years of advocacy, we were able to force the city to release an RFP uh, request for proposal for a city-owned building, which had been lying abandoned and derelict for more than 10 years. Um, and we won that RFP response, and we were able to secure that building. Um, and we are now turning that building into a community hub and a community center. Um, along with the um, with with the winning of the building, the city has given us $12 million. And since then, we've been able to um, raise a few more million dollars. Um, and we will all, we're also looking at, um, you know, different forms of financing, new market tax credits, historic tax credits, et cetera. So, you know, um, just being creative um, in terms of uh, how you can finance um, these spaces, um, seeing what types of programs are out there, um, asking elected representatives for um, support, um, and, um, and you know, again, there are a lot of grant programs. Having said that, it's not easy for a small community organization to, you know, take over, you know, like a private building. East New York CLT had recently did that and they're making it happen. Um, so, you know, I would say um, that can't be a reason for us not um, uh, uh, sort of moving forward with CLTs um, and, um, looking at CLTs as a viable option. I think there are creative ways we can we can do this um, and we need to do this um, for communities that have been shut out for too long. I'm not in New York, but I would definitely say, I think Andy brought up a good point because um, I've seen this is, you brought up one of the bigger problems is like those dollar lot programs. We should not be giving dollar lots that I just came from a city, I won't say where, but they were doing that and giving it to people who were building um, you know, building properties for people making well over $100,000 a year up to 150% AMI. That shouldn't be. There are ways cities and municipalities own a lot of land that they're just sitting on. So it's not impossible to transfer that ownership to, you know, a, a community group. I think there's advocacy there. We're fighting the same thing. It's like, you're just sitting on land and lots there are several organizations um, in, in Houston as well. And again, Baltimore is one of them where I know that they were able to get land um, and buildings transferred um, to their uh, CLT and to other community groups. 
But I think that is kind of going to be the easiest lift because yes, things are too expensive for most small nonprofits to actually purchase. But if you're not doing anything with the land and it's just being, it's just sitting there and there are no plans for it, which most cities don't even have the capacity to make a plan for all of the land and buildings that they own. I think advocating for that simple transfer over to a community organization is where they can use their funds that they raise, not for purchasing, but to renovate, rehab, upkeep and operate versus actually doing acquisition. I think community groups should not have to be acquiring um, land through purchase, it should be a it should be a transfer, and that's going to be a fight that we have to fight um, because it's not like they don't have it. Every city has a bunch of land and a bunch of buildings that they're not doing anything with. Are there any final comments before we end today's webinar on this question? People are asking if um this this webinar will be available like a link later so they can watch it. Or share it. Yes, in about 20 minutes. Boom. Amazing. With that, I believe this webinar has ended. Please share it with your friends and your family. And thank you so much for spending your Friday afternoon with us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for being a great panel and people. <laughs>